And, and to what extent uh, are, are some of those schemes being seen as um, a cynical ploys by business um, or being seen as uh, really engaging ways to get closer to, to customers and to, to actually help them out in, in difficult times? You know, sometimes they're off the mark. So Kentucky Fried Chicken offered to fix potholes in and around, uh, you know, the local restaurants. And I think to some extent, when we looked at the data, it didn't really do much for, for KFC. But it's done really strong for companies like Walmart. We're seeing Im improvements in Walmart's sustainability, green dimensions, as well as its sort of trust and respect. And Walmart had had a very challenging sort of profile in our, in our study up until, you know, sort of the last 18 months. So I think it's very, very important that in this environment where, you know, consumers realize that the markets don't operate without some sort of necessary intervention, that companies are sort of self-regulating and that they're acting in a responsible manner. And presumably the, um, those, the those, sorry, presu presumably those companies that have a really good fit with what they're trying to do in relation to what their brand is all about are the ones that are actually going to benefit the most out of those type of uh, uh, associations. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I wrote a book last fall called The Brand Bubble. And one of the sort of conclusions I, I came out of it was really that, you know, marketing is not a department. It's really a way of thinking inside a company. And so all of these elements through the supply chain, through the retail, through the customer um, call center, through product innovation, through distribution, even investor relations, all those are potential touch points for marketing. And so you, what you're seeing, like with the example that I cited with Microsoft, is the ability for a company to use its existing assets in a, in a very, I think, positive and powerful sort of marketing capacity, realizing that marketing may not have an immediate effect on sales, but it's engendering goodwill. So uh, the third of the four values that I had for you today, David, was this focus on this underlying uh, American response to the recession, which is this sort of movement from anxiety to action. And we call it indestructible spirit. And this is really the sort of temperance of the fact that, yes, consumers have been rocked over the last 18 months, but yet there's this undeniable sort of American optimism and sense of opportunity that's now manifesting itself in consumers taking control. They have felt betrayal from authority figures. What they're doing instead is they're devising their own plans. They're creating their most important economy, which is theirs. And they're almost acting as free agents, setting out to really sort of gain more control over the future or essentially control the parts of their life that they can control. What we're seeing in that is this consumer strategy that we call durable living. And this is the emphasis on the fact that Consumers realize that this is going to be a prolonged period of adversity. And so consumers are digging in, they're thinking in terms of the long term. They're doing a couple of interesting things. Clearly they're saving more um, and spending less, but they're also looking um, at tomorrow. They're thinking about re-evaluating re their careers, looking at family planning, looking at their goals and aspirations moving forward. Quite interestingly, in today's environment, 68% of Americans now have a library card. It's the highest percentage ever that we've seen in, in American library system. So this movement toward wanting to acquire more knowledge, to have more sort of intellectual breadth, is a trend that, that we see uh, in America. We also see as part of this durable living a really interesting trend toward um, moving from take to make, which I mean is a rise of a do-it-yourself culture where consumers are doing much more involvement in home canning, uh, the rise of backyard uh, chicken and hen raising, which seems like a fringe trend. And you know, as the media has pointed out, it doesn't look like it's economically viable when you factor in all the, all the dimensions. But at the same point, there's an underlying need for these sort of behaviors, which is the desire for sustainability, self-sustainability and the ability to control one's destiny. Um, we talked a little bit about briefly about the do-it-yourself culture, and there's a really interesting article in the Financial Times last month that showed that 30% of all American homes, including cottages and second homes, are now owner-built. So people are rolling up their sleeves. They're wanting to, you know, learn skills. They're wanting to get involved and make things as opposed to simply uh, consume them. So we see that in the rise of spices. The spice market is up not only in our study but in the profits. We see the rise in shoe repair. Um, interestingly enough, the average um, American vehicle 
in operation has reached 9.4 years. It's its highest ever in American history since the Model T was introduced. So, you know, the fact that Americans are holding onto their cars longer, they're um, holding onto their clothes longer, they're mending and repairing, those are all sort of themes that sort of fit into this aspect of durable living. Um, we also note this rise, David, it's interesting, of uh, what we call swishing parties where um, women get together and basically exchange clothes and, and have cocktails and find ways to uh, exchange shoes and merchandise and, and the like um, and do it in a social environment. Great. Um, well, John, John when, I, when I get home, I'm going to introduce that concept to my wife. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck indeed. So what, what that tells us from a management principle out of this trend toward durability is that you know, you need to be a brand that lasts. What are you doing to show dividends in your brand offering so that it makes your brand worth something to the consumer who's increasingly acting like an investor, looking for sort of long-term potential returns? So some interesting examples of, of brands that are doing that. Patagonia has um, what they call the Footprint Chronicles, a really innovative new website that allows um, people to go in and examine the carbon footprint, the entire sustainability practices behind each item that they produce. So complete transparency. One of the interesting things about Patagonia is I think they have stated very publicly that every time they do things that are good for the environment, it, they actually find that it's also phenomenally good for their business as well. Absolutely. It's good for me, good for you, good for the environment, and, and everybody wins. And that's part of this sort of longer term view that kind of comes out of this idea of being a company that lasts, having seen farther and, and realizing that it's not just about today. We see that manifest in self and business where Jack Welch has said that simply focusing primarily on shareholder value is a short term strategy. And I think in his words, he said it's a dumb strategy, but it reflects the larger sort of deals and issues that we're facing in America, we've got fundamental challenges with healthcare. We've got really big problems that we need to own up to and, and face, and it's going to take considerable time in order to do that. So, you know, really interesting companies are stepping in, looking at the long term. Fidelity, for example, has 529 rewards program. 529 in the United States is a college education savings program that households can, can take on. What they're doing is instead of instant credits, rewards back for your card purchases, what you're doing is you're investing in your child's education. So, so these sort of trends toward encouraging the consumer to look out over the horizons to invest and to think beyond sort of today's consumption is definitely a rising trend. Um, and then lastly, you know, the last sort of trend I was going to speak about is this, this um, big, big focus on community. And we call it return to the fold. But in today's environment, there's an increasing value on neighbors, on local communities, and on your networks. And what, how I define local means that your network may be based in Facebook and Twitter, where you've got a tremendous network all over the world, but it's retrenching around networks that you can really trust. And that is really important because that forms the basis of how consumers interact with brands, the types of decisions that, that they make in the marketplace, and the peers that they use. So, you know, a couple of examples that we see are the rise of Zipcar. You know, Zipcar went from a fringe idea to an idea that became very, very much, you know, part of the American fabric. The idea so of, zip, you know, zip, not... Zip, Zipcar is the concept of sharing, basically. Correct. So, you know, you don't own the car, you basically rent it and grab it, take it and go. And they have an impending, if, not, if it hasn't already been done, an impending IPO that looks really lucrative. Um, there's this other trend toward local currencies. Um, you know, in one case, you know, local towns are setting up their own forms of currency around people that they can trust. Now, in part, this isn't due to the fact that people can't get loans, but doing more things on a local movement. And this is part of a huge trend, the artisanal trend, where products and brands that have local sort of storytelling, local origins are more desirable and are, and are building sort of greater currency in today's environment. We also see that with the rise of what we call carrot mobs. I don't call them carrot mobs, but they're known as carrot mobs, which is this movement toward consumers banding together to get a business to incentivize them to do the right thing rather than boycott them. So as you would expect, these have originated in California. But um, carrot mobs basically organize to aggregate the consumer's business to get another business to basically do the right thing, whether it's social responsibility, 
fairness in labor practices, et cetera. So, you know, if you put that together with the internet, you put it together with, you know, disruptive technology like Yelp, or you look at Twitter and Facebook and the ability to aggregate communities, you're going to see this further trend rising where consumers can organize themselves in ways that they can get what they really want out of the marketplace and through that power almost create a Walmart-like scaling effect. Um, Walmart obviously has done an amazing job with green labeling. That's part of this cooperative consumerism movement as well. And then lastly, you know, it was interesting to note we saw the rise of more accessible yacht clubs in America. We call them blue collar yacht clubs where you can join them, but you have to work in the boatyard as sort of currency to get in. So this sort of cooperative working together is really important. We see that play out in many, many different ways. Um, I was able to spend some time with Tony Shea, the uh, CEO of Zappos last month uh, when I was speaking at the Economist Conference. And Tony has really built an amazing following on Twitter you know, over a million people because he believes that his employees should be out front and center as part of the community uh, talking to people and building the Zappos brand. We saw that with Scott Monty from Ford who's done an amazing job sort of being the company ambassador and, and speaking out into the, uh, into the Twitter marketplace, helping consumers and, and everyone else understand the amazing innovation that's going on at Ford and the, and the types of programs that, that, are, that are advancing there. Or, you know, just the rise of other sort of community focused ideas that, that we see out there where uh, bands of companies are organizing together to kind of create value in the marketplace and leveraging these environments. So in, in a little kind of broad strokes, we see fundamental shifts. We don't believe that, you know, that the consumer is going to go back to the way they were before, um, nor do we believe that the consumer is going to be endlessly frugal. Um, I'm really advocating that there's going to be something, you know, in between that's going to be really great for brands and really great for business. What it means is that businesses will need to be more ethical, more sustainable, more innovative, and they're going to have to compete more effectively for scarcer uh, amount of the consumer's dollars. And if it's done the right way, maybe what will happen eventually is America will move from sort of the mass consumer of sort of quantity of goods to more of a sort of um, you know, mass producer of quality goods. That is a tall order and that remains to be seen. Well, America, in a sense, has always bailed out the rest of the world as being the spender of last resort. Um, and I think it's intriguing to see how some of the trends that you've spoken about uh, today um, will potentially reshape America's role um, in uh, defining how consumers uh, change and are willing to change uh, around the world. Uh, John, thank you very much indeed for uh, spending the time and sharing your insights uh, with us. Uh, John's book um, is available um, at all good bookstores, both uh, bricks and mortar stores and also um, uh, digital stores as well. Um, and uh, to n understand more about YNR, um, you can find out more about them through the website that's on the screen at the moment. So from me in London, I'd like to, like to thank very much John uh, in New York. Uh, thank you very much indeed. David, thank you.